Jamie Woodhouse, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Hart. Great. Yeah. So we're, we're going to talk about a new word for me, <laughs> uh, sentientism. First of all, did I say it right? Yeah, that's a great start. Your pronunciation was perfect. It has a few too good. many syllables, but you got it. Okay, good. Because you know, as, as an American, I assume that I, my pronunciation is just going <laughs> to be sloppy <laughs> compared to clipped British way. Not at all. So um, be before we get into, uh, oh, I heard, a, I think I heard a sentient being in your yeah, background. Just she there. is. A, I'm highly confident she's sentient. This is Luna. Luna, what's up? <laughs> yeah, we'll see if she participates anymore. Hopefully, she'll calm down a little bit. <laughs> okay, that's all. That's all good. Um, so let's let's start. I, I've been listening to to your podcast, and I love how oh, you. Oh, great! Uh, Thank you. You uh, introduce one of your guests by asking so. Tell, tell people who haven't heard of you what they should know. So I'll, I'll, I'll steal that and throw it at you. Yeah, of course, of course. So I, I guess by trade, I'm a, a consultant, but I also do a range of volunteering and NGO projects and other things. But I guess my main project is why I'm here to talk to you today is promoting building community around and amateur, amateurishly developing this worldview or philosophy called sentientism. So that's uh, me in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, and I live in deep north London. We're not really in London. We're sort of on the outskirts uh, with my family, including Luna behind me. So. Okay. Is that like Hemel Hempstead? We're not far from there. We're a bit close to London now. We're in Edgware. So we're still on the tube line, on the, on the okay. metro, metro line, but only just. We're on the last stop. So if you fall asleep, we're where, we, where you might wake up. Okay. <clears throat> gotcha. I used, to, I used to get off at Finchley Road. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're sort of between Finchley Road and Hemel Hempstead, if you like. Yeah. That's pretty okay. close. Very good. Um, so for, let's, let's, um, tee it up with like, what, what is sentientism? And I think, you know, you, you answered that the, in your podcast, you say that there's two, there's two questions, right? What's real and what matters. Yeah. So yeah. is, is that based is basically that sentientism in a, in a nutshell? Well, it's it, sentientism is trying to answer those two questions. And I think they're probably two of the most interesting and deepest questions there are, you know, what's real and what should we believe, but equally as important, what should we care about? What matters morally? What, you know, what do good and bad even mean? So um, there's loads of ways of answering those two questions, of course, um, but sometimes people bundle them up into a worldview or a philosophy that tries to say, look, let's, this is a way of thinking about life. This is a way about thinking about morality that we can package up. And I summarize sentientism as in one sentence as evidence, reason, and compassion for all sentient beings. So the question about what's real and what to believe, it says we should take a naturalistic approach where we use evidence and reasoning to, you know, with humility, engage honestly with reality and try to understand it as well as we can, knowing that's always going to be imperfect. So that's the evidence and reason part, answering what's real. And then the compassion for sentient beings answers the moral question of, you know, as we look around the world, which entities matter? You know, does this computer mouse matter? Does my mug matter? Does Luna the puppy matter? You know, mm. do you and I matter? Um, and sentientism, the clue is in the name, is that it suggests we should use this characteristic or this quality of sentience to decide which entities matter, which should get moral consideration, which should we feel compassion for. And sentience in the simplest terms is the capacity to have experiences. Uh, so, you know, to suffer, to flourish, to feel good things or feel bad things. Uh, yeah, so that, in a nutshell, that's it. Evidence, reason and compassion for all sentient beings. Okay. So one of the challenges I had when trying to prepare for this podcast is I kind of slept through philosophy classes. Yeah. Like they, <laughs> they, they rarely seemed particularly useful or interesting to me, but then, in, in, you know, in hearing you, you talk to your guests, you're throwing around Hume and Kant and, uh, you know, various people who's like, you know, like I probably passed a test on them one point yeah, but i, I yeah. feel like I, I don't really have a grounding so when you you know you've talked about sort of the the limitations of ethical humanism and um you know your upbringing is sort of you know like you know christian light maybe yeah. um like is can we maybe can we can we set sort of like a historical stage for like if, if there is this new philosophical movement that you're uh promoting yeah. Like, where does it come from and what is it in response to? Like, why do we even need one? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, wow, that's a big question. 
because in a way it's quite a new term you know it probably was first used i think in 1971 so it hasn't been around that long but at the same time the the ideas within it are extremely old and go back thousands of years and you might even argue you know it could be pre-human um so let me answer your last question first which is you know why do we even need a worldview because some people might say well you know it's not really necessary one i just quite like having a really simple way of describing a way of looking at the world that I think is appropriate and good. But the reason I think worldviews are important is because whether we think we have them or not, everybody has them. Hmm. And every human decision is in some way based on that worldview, on that way of thinking. It's based on, um, of course, our genetics and the way our brains are configured, uh, but it's also configured, is it, yeah, our decisions are also based on the values, the things we think are important, the things we care about, and they're based on what we believe to be true as well. So to my mind, whether people think they have a worldview or not, they do have one, and that underpins almost every decision we take. Um, so in a way, my hope with sentientism is that if we can uh, you know, popularise and persuade more people to adopt a, a, a really strong, robust, compassionate worldview, that would then have a knock-on impact onto every decision, you know, humans take. So that's the that's why I think worldviews are important. Um, but I can come back to I guess the the roots of the idea, and it might be useful to explain, you know, how I got to it personally as well, because that might make that, it a little bit more. That would be great. Uh, yeah, realistic. Because because I share your frustration with much of philosophy. I think lots of it is interesting, um, but it does feel like so much of philosophy has almost skipped over these really deep, important everyday questions and has gone on to all sorts of other crazy shit. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and that can be, that can be fun, right? But as for you, like, how does that, how is that really relevant when you bring it back to everyday decisions that we're trying to take to get through life and to make the world a better place? And I think that many philosophers have sort of skipped over these basics and gone on to abstruse, weird, arcane trolley problems. And I want to drag people back <laughs> And say, look, we, we haven't answered these two questions correctly yet. So let's let's try and do that. Yeah, um, I, I remember in college, the only, like there was a one line. And I don't think I was even taking the course. I was just talking to a roommate who was taking the course who was trying to describe John Rawls theory of justice. And like it was the idea of like, pretend you're going to be born onto this planet and you have no idea who you're going to be. Yeah. Like that was like the first bit of philosophy that actually like, like woke something in me. And yeah, said, oh, that's sort of a, veil, really... a veil of ignorance. And, you know, if you don't know which state you're going to be, which type of person, your background, your country, your level of poverty, your class, your race, your gender, your sex, you don't know any of those things. You, you're just going to be randomly dropped in. How would you order that society to be fair? Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, and then comparing that to, you know, some of the philosophy I did stumble upon, sort of logical philosophy and, you know, Saul Kripke names and naming. Like, I just, I never... I never understood why it was important. And, you know, yeah. I don't understand why lots of things are important, like, you know, quantum physics and, and cellular, you know, whatever, but doesn't mean they're not important, but they just, it never, it never seemed to me to be a bit the basis for a, um, a deliberate life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the part of the idea behind sentientism in a way, it's not really competing with all of those detailed uh, works of philosophy, because many of them might fit within the structure and they might fit on top of mm. sentientism as a platform because it's so basic i mean it literally is just evidence and reason and compassion for all sentient beings it leaves lots of space for loads of different um you know ethical philosophies or even approaches to epistemology that you could then layer on top of that so there's still plenty to fight about and argue about <laughs> um, and what one thing that's interesting is that as you look through all, a lot of the different particular moral philosophies you look at you know john rawls's thinking or you look at people who have been thinking about human rights, or you look at people who have been thinking about maybe a feminist care ethic, or a relational approach to ethics, um, or a deontological approach where uh, you know you work out rules and you follow rules, or as you as you mentioned Kant, you know this idea of humans being ends in themselves that have their own value that needs to be respected uh, under all situations. You can take all of that sort of smorgasbord of different views and you can still apply those in different ways. But what sentientism says is that stuff shouldn't just apply to humans. You need to recognize and grant moral consideration for all sentient beings. So you can still take a rights approach or you can still apply rules or you can have a care ethic or um, you, know, you can think in a utilitarian way. 
But if you want to, you know, align with sentientism, you've got to recognise that it's not just humans that matter. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. It's a sort of, you might call it a really pluralistic, very simple platform, which you can build on. And it's really interesting to take a lot of the people who've thought about human ethics and just go, well, yeah. why doesn't that work? You know, for the veil of ignorance, what happens if we also put species, hide species behind that? Huh. So you could appear in the world as a farmed animal or a wild animal. What would that change about how you'd order the world? Uh -huh. So you can reuse a lot of that human ethics, I think, and just broaden it out. Um, but, but the way I got to it personally was, and people come to this in many different ways. Um, for me, I grew up, a, I guess, with a, a, a Christian worldview. And it wasn't a pretty strong part of uh, our life growing up. It was just the default for my parents and the community we lived in. No, I didn't choose it. It was just, you know, what, we were, what I was told to believe and what I assumed was true. And I guess I went through a process a two-part process in my early teenage years. One was just learning about the history of Christianity and all the different sets and parts of it and all of the other religions and non-religious worldviews and seeing it in a sociological context. And that, I guess, helped me to see that, to my mind, those religions were very clearly human fabrications <laughs> rather than a reflection of reality. So as I was spotting, you know, looking for the evidence, looking for the coherent looking for the consistency I just didn't find it the the claims that were being made about heaven and hell and a deity and so on just didn't stack up so on on that sort of evidence and reason side I I guess moved to a atheistic or an extreme agnostic way of thinking about the world um, but I also saw I guess some ethical challenges in some interpretations of those religious worldviews as well so you know threatening young children with hell for circumstances outside of their control seemed um, you know, unethical to me. And there were some more class classical things, you know, that social conservatism that might flow through different forms of discrimination. I don't think are essential to any religion, but the interpretations of some religions I saw led people that way to, you know, homophobia and sexism and anti-Semitism and so on. So there were ethical and evidence reasons why I just, you know, decided I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. I, you know, I became a, an atheist or an agnostic, extreme agnostic, you might say. Um, but, but atheism or agnosticism doesn't really say anything about ethics or you know what to do in the world it's just the lack of a belief in something which isn't particularly useful really um so then i lay it on i guess what more broadly is a naturalistic approach which isn't just i don't happen to believe in god it just says more positively you know i'm going to try and hold credence in things and beliefs based on evidence and reason as far as i can work those things out um, so that was a more positive way of saying instead of i just don't believe in it in this thing Here's how I'm going to choose to believe. Um, but then I moved to humanism for the positive ethical side as well, because humanism in simple terms says we'll have a naturalistic way of understanding the world. You know, we don't need a religion or the supernatural or a deity to tell us what's right and what's wrong. Our sense of what's right and wrong comes from a universal compassion for all humans. You know, all humans matter, regardless of say, sex, race, gender, sexual preference, you know, characteristic history, whatever all humans matter. So that felt like it was layer, taking this sort of naturalistic facts and evidence thing, but then layering on a compassionate ethic. Uh, but the problem there, I guess, is it is partly in the name, is that it, there's an implication, and this isn't true for all humanists. Many humanists, like most humans, also do have compassion that goes beyond the human. Um, but by definition, it is quite anthropocentric. It's quite focused on human beings and human definitions of uh, right and wrong and most humanists today do pretty much restrict their compassion to other humans so that seemed like a problem to me um, so in essence I was looking for something that would keep the naturalism keep the universal compassion but extend that compassion out to any being that has the capacity to suffer so that was how I got to it I've been rambling on too long now but yeah hopefully that yeah no add some uh, color that that's great and and you know, part, partly what I want to do here. So I have um, lots of questions and lots, you know, and, and sort of, you know, following, like one of the things I'm trying not to worry about is that you're like, you know, way more than I do. So my questions and objections are going to seem very puerile and, and you know, easily knocked down. But, but it seems not like there's, there's two parts to talk about. But let's, and, you know, there's the evidence and reason. And then there's the compassion. Let's let's start with the compassion because that's easier mm. for me, and I think it'll be easier for 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 the listeners. 
uh, many, you know, many of whom I know are are deeply religious and and are may all be already triggered um, yeah, yeah. by by the conversation. So you mentioned the term sentientism is from 1971. So I'm imagining that's sort of like Peter Singer, Animal Liberation Time. Yeah. So so um, there's two ways of answering this. You, you're right. That was when the term was first used. It was first used in a couple of weird contexts. Actually, it was used by one. Um, academic, um, I won't go into the details behind it, but it was a very strange use of the term that didn't seem enormously relevant. But then it was um, mainly used by a chap called, or first used in, I think, a proper context, by a chap called John Rodman in 1977, actually to criticise Singer and Richard Ryder and some of the other people in the Oxford group, uh, you know, the Godloviches and others, who were, who were talking about animal advocacy and sentience as this moral qualifier and in essence, echoing what Jeremy Bentham said way back in 1789, I think, where he said, look, the question is, can they suffer? Which is a one way of saying, you know, are they sentient? That's almost the same question. Um, so, so you're right, you know, the Godloviches and Singer and Ryder and the Oxford group and various others were talking about this idea of granting moral consideration to all sentient beings. And John Rodman actually coined the term, I think, sentientism to criticize it. And he was saying, look, this is just another form of discrimination because you're discriminating against entities that aren't sentient and that can't suffer. Um, and to a degree, you know, Richard Ryder and, and others then picked the term up and said, yes, that is exactly what we're saying. We're saying we should have moral consideration and compassion for all sentient beings. And yes, we are discriminating against non-sentient entities and they don't care because they can't experience anything. So uh -huh. that is, you know, if you like the only moral discrimination, that's the the place to try and draw this fuzzy line to say, you know, we should care about every being that has a perspective that can suffer, that has an experience. And beyond that, we might still care, but that would be instrumental. But, but again, there's always a temptation in these conversations to sort of go back to, you know, the Oxford group or go back to Bentham, go back to enlightenment, enlightenment ideas. But the roots of this sentientist concept, can, sentientism concept, or another long word people might have come across as sentiocentrism, which is basically this you know, granting moral consideration based on sentience, that's one half of sentientism, has really deep ancient roots in so many different cultures, religious and not. Um, so again, if you look back into you know, elements of Rastafarian culture or uh, various indigenous cultures, you look at the idea of ahimsa that obviously is common to many of the um, Eastern centric religions, you know, you can already find these ideas here, the idea of not harming was explicitly applied to non-humans. You know, it wasn't just a human concept. So I think this idea about caring about non-humans has deep ancient um, roots as well, even though it might've been formalized and some of these words invented more recently. Right. So um, I've interviewed um, folks around, you know, like indigenous thinking lately, mm. and um, in particular, um, an Australian academic and um, indigenous person, um, Tyson Young Caporta, who's, who's mm. written an amazing book, Sand Talk. And, you know, his, he's really convinced me that like, we really need to pay a lot of attention to indigenous thinking, because it just has a track record. Like, if you're yeah. just talking about evidence and reason, like, there's a lot of reason to think that our that all our modern brilliance is leading us down some very strange paths. So like, let's, let's privilege stuff that works. And but he talks about, um, you know, also compassion for rocks, like, or, or at least, um, you know, attention. And, and so like, is, is there, there, like, there was something in, in uh, listening to your interview with um, was it Massimo P P Pugliucci? Yes. Yeah. It that, that felt a little bit sort of binary yeah. to me, like that we have, you know, there's a line somewhere. So like, you know, are trees sentient? Is soil sentient? Are microbes sentient? Is there is the minerals that then become my body? Like, when do they become yeah. sentient? Is, is that is that just um, nitpicking? Or is there something, you know, important there in that in that sort of? Thing? No, I think there's something important there. And um, what the one thing about the sentientism idea is it doesn't tell us which things are sentient. It doesn't have a list of species or entities either it just says you know follow the science with humility and you know use the evidence we can find now you know so 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 different sentientists will disagree about where to draw that line now my personal view is i think in roughly in line with scientific consensus that it seems that um you know certainly humans mammals birds reptiles um basically all of the invertebrates we have strong evidence they seem to 
be sentient. Um, and there's increasing understanding, even in the invertebrate world, with insects, you know, decapods, cephalopods like the octopus, that they are also sentient as well. With some of the simpler invertebrates, it's, it's less clear. Um, and my personal view is that there probably is a fuzzy boundary where you know, we might legalistically decide to draw a line, but that isn't how reality works. I think there probably are fuzzy boundaries, both in reality and in our ability to have knowledge of them that mean, you know, it's a tricky barrier to draw. But from, to jump to the flip side of that question, as you were asking about, okay, what about trees and plants and rocks and rivers and other aspects of the ecosystem? Again, I'd take quite a strong, I haven't seen any convincing evidence that uh, trees, rocks, rivers, anything outside of the animal kingdom is likely to have uh, sentience. You know, I, I'm not 100% sure they don't, but I just have very low credence because I haven't seen the evidence. And that's really based on, I guess, three lines of uh, inference. This isn't about perfect knowledge. This isn't about yes or no. This is just building evidence. And those lines really are about, you know, the evolutionary history we share with animals and the drivers, including the need to move around our environment that seem to have driven our uh, capacity for sentience. Um, there's our, I guess, behavior and communications. And while plants do show an enormous richness of communications, we're learning more about that all the time, particularly with, um, you know, the fungal networks and how trees communicate and so on. It has a different character to what we see in the animal kingdom. And then in the, I guess, the anatomy and just the physical information processing that's going on when we experience our own consciousness doesn't seem to have any analog in the plant kingdom and certainly not in rocks or anywhere else um so so that's my personal view but at the same time there are others and i've interviewed a couple of them who have a radically different view so um i talked to a guy called luke roloffs who's an amazing thoughtful philosopher who subscribes to panpsychism and in a sense he says um you know yes maybe there's a fuzzy boundary for sentience and consciousness but he thinks that means it never really stops so in a sense almost everything has some minimal level of consciousness and sentience within uh -huh. it even down to the le level of ele elementary particles so i don't agree with that view others you know others do so so that's a long answer to where is this sentience boundary and there are open questions there um but there's a there's a second question that you're asking i think which is one is you know how do we ascribe sentience and where do we draw the line there but even, then you, there's a second question, which is, okay, even if we are confident that plants aren't sentient, shouldn't they matter anyway? Shouldn't they matter even if they're not sentient, even if they can't experience, they can't suffer? Um, and I think most sentientists would uh, agree that they do, but it's a, in a different way. So for me, um, the environment, the ecosystem we all share is absolutely critically important. I care about it richly and deeply in a moral way because of its criticality, criticality to all of the sentient beings on that we share the planet with. That's why I care about rocks and rivers and plants and ecosystems and, you know, Gaia mm -hmm. as a system. But I don't care about them intrinsically. That's why the Earth matters more to me than, you know, a distant planet in a different solar system with no life on it or around it. To me, that is an interesting ecosystem in, intellectually. But it doesn't have any moral worth because there's no sentient being that can suffer or flourish. So that, again, a too long answer, but hopefully that's giving you a sense of where the fuzzy boundaries around sentientism might lie and, to, and the differences of opinion about the nature of it. Right. But also the fact that you can still care about non-sentient things in a deep way. Um, it's just an instrumental second order morality rather than Yeah. Well, I'm happy to hear that you're, you know, you're um open to consideration of other perspectives because like you know from my perspective it's almost like you know I, I i kind of like the gaia hypothesis like yeah like there's this like when you look at the earth and and the amazing planet we live on that we haven't yet managed to destroy like to think that 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 it has a consciousness and that like yeah. you know so we're like two you know two cells in the right pinky arguing about whether the body has consciousness or just the cells yeah yeah um, and, and i think there's a there's a lot to like about that systemic holistic way of thinking you know everything is connected it's a system that runs um you know i don't think the earth is conscious i don't think it experiences anything to be honest i think the earth as a system you know if all humans got wiped out and all life got wiped out it would still continue to run physically and operate you know i think it's essentially amoral and 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 non-conscious but either way i think we can still share a you know a, 
a strong overlap in our caring about the planet and the environment, even if it's for slightly different reasons. And I guess the one one area where I do get nervous, and I don't think you know your your audience, given its nature, will fall into this trap. But there are some people who will they'll go from okay an anthropocentric concern for humans, right? We care about the whole human species. That's great, good start. Um, and then they will jump particularly in the context of climate change and this environmental crisis to a very expansive moral consideration for you know Gaia for the entire planet for all of the ecosystems for the rocks and rivers for the, uh, the plants that we share this planet with as well which feels very generous um, and technically that might be called a you know a biocentrism would include all plants and then ecocentrism would be even broader than that and think about the moral value of all ecosystems but too many people who do that, which I think is a generous, generous, positive step, too many people who do that still conveniently carve out the vast numbers of very obviously sentient animals from their moral consideration. So we see this, I think this is the center of gravity of the modern environmental movement. You know, you almost get to the point where people are more willing to ascribe rights to rivers than they are to a pig in a factory farm. Um, and so, so in a sense, sentientism is saying, you can go beyond sentience if you like, Right, that's fine if you want to, but please don't forget any of the sentient beings. Every single sentient being has to matter morally. You have to take that seriously. Even if you want to care about rocks and rivers and trees, that's fine. But please also care about farmed and wild and liminal animals too. And right. I and I'd argue that even if um, you do, you know, care about plants directly morally, there is still something distinctively different about the capacity to suffer. That means for me. Um, you know, cutting a carrot is a morally different act from cutting a pig, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so again, that's a, too much of a rant, but you know, there, I think there are some risks in going too far if we forget the sentient beings. So that's my main thing: is just don't forget the sentient beings. Right. Okay. That's yeah. That's beautiful because you know, every every vegan I think has had that philosophical challenge to them. Is like, you know, how why do you hate plants so much? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like you know, like. The, the lettuce is suffering too and right and, which and, is... I, and in a way that's a danger of this you know biocentric or ecocentric way of thinking because you're almost playing into that and saying look a tree should have rights as well and they'll say well you know then cutting down a tree is the same as cutting the throat of a pig and and i think even if you do care about trees there's still something different about this capacity to suffer that should you know raise sentient beings up another level and mm -hmm. and you know again i've had a couple of frustrating conversations in my podcast with people who've said you know, they have this rich, deep, ecocentric concern for the environment. And they will say, you know, nature is wonderful. Uh, everything is connected. Life is life. Cycles and patterns continue as they have for millennia. Um, as part of those patterns, life consumes life. Humans are part of life. We must also consume life. So pass me a bacon sandwich and some chicken nuggets. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you know, you've gone from this super generous moral scope where you richly care about everything, but then you, you again, you use this sort of nature, the circle of life. You know, I'm just playing my part to give you an excuse to continue to needlessly harm sentient beings. So there's just some traps in that expansive ways of thinking we need to watch out for. We need to focus on making sure that those sentient beings get protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And um you know, and I've had I've had discussions with with um, podcast guests around hunting, yeah. which which I can't categorically disapprove of <laughs> um, compared to factory farming. And especially when I talk about, you know, sort of indigenous cultures. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the way things were and, um, you know, life does consume life and all, all the truisms there. Um, you know, it's, it seems to be just that, it, that a lot it, of that and, and, is... And, and I share some of that sympathy, but there's a danger there, again, because if you listen to the arguments from, you know, the people who run factory farms in the US, right, massive ranches, or the people who've been driving the de deforestation in Brazil, they will actually use the same arguments. They will say, this is our way of life. It's our tradition. It's a natural part of the process, you know, and it's like, well, you know, when you think about it from the perspective of the victim, none of that really helps, right? Whether you're doing it for traditional reasons or, you know, whatever well, the motivation of the human is, yeah. 
when you think about it from the victim's perspective, it doesn't make a difference. But, well, but at the same time, if, if someone's in a, you know, if someone's in a survival situation or in a situation where they just have different alternatives, absolutely, that's a radically different situation from, you know, the people who buy from factory farms. So the context can make a difference. But again, I think we need to always just check ourselves and think from the perspective of the victim and play that into the story as well, whatever that story is. Right. Well, there's ways in which systems thinking can elide the the individual value of the pig yeah. or the yeah. But there but there's also ways in which not thinking systemically. Like you know, there are plenty of vegans who are very happy to eat sugar, which was grown on plantations on, on deforested land. That you know that monoculture, uh, vegan agriculture is is arguably you know destroying habitat. Well, it's not actually taking a um, you know a bolt to the brain of a cow. But it's it's still leading to like I think we need we need you know we need yeah. both the reductionist and the holistic view together to be to live uh, responsibly in this complex world. I completely agree. I mean, and, and I think those different perspectives can help us come to a you know a more rounded view. Um, I mean, I'd certainly agree that you know this sort of idea that being vegan means you've achieved some sort of moral perfection is just absolutely insane right there's no <laughs> there's no basis to that whatsoever we're trying to do better in a fairly obvious way and that doesn't mean the end of the story in terms of you know trying to make the world a better place or you know live by causing less suffering um and i agree that systemic way of thinking has you know puts a very different lens on problems and can really help us see a different way through um at the same time i think you're right we've the, the more individualistic perspective is useful because it is the individuals that really experience the suffering. And as long as we're playing that into the calculus as we think these three through, we'll have a better chance of taking better decisions. Yeah, well, there's also, I think, a, a PR consideration. So, you know, when we were emailing, yeah. I was trying to decide if I was a sentientist or not. And I think you know, what, I, what I've come up with is that I'm, I'm, I'm sentientist um friendly but I, right yeah. now i'm like i'm more of a a contextualist like does it does it work and there's something about you know humanism and sentientism that feels like it's hard for humans to kind of get behind as opposed to like here's the picture of the beached whale the, and yeah. here's the, here's the picture of the starving child like this is going to get us to take action and be like we need stories yeah. That makes yeah. sense to our to our ancient brains. I was just reading yeah. a piece by uh, uh, Yuval Noah Harari uh, in the New York Times talking about climate change. And his point is that th that that none of the facts are going to move us because it's not a good story. So well, a good story is Greta Thunberg sa saying the old are sacrificing the young. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, we get that one. There's a narrative. I've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. The narrative, right? Yeah. So, is there is there a narrative behind sentientism, or is it? Are we just asking people to be more philosophical than we than they can be? Yeah, I'm not sure. There's a narrative behind it. It doesn't have a story within it, really. But I think it can enable many stories, including you know Greta Thunberg and Yuval Noah Harari, who, interestingly, I think both are suspected sentientists, and yeah. <laughs> and um, you know both of them have a naturalistic way of thinking. You know, they use evidence and reason. Neither of them have a supernatural worldview. Um, and, you know, both of them are vegan, which is normally a good indicator that you care about sentient beings. So I totally agree. And I think that there is a danger, you know, we'll come on to the sort of naturalistic side of this thing in a bit, that it can feel quite cold and clinical and scientistic and, you know, all a bit dull and locked down and everything is in a spreadsheet. And that's not the implication. You know, we can come to this compassion thing, both through rationality and thought and philosophy, but we can also come to it, you know, emotionally or through stories or through narratives or through you know, look into the eyes of a puppy or, you know, there's, there's many different ways to come to that compassion and many ways to then build interesting stories on top of it to make it compelling. Um, and in a way, the, you know, the sentientism idea, it's interesting to think about um, the opposite because the first choice is, um, you know, do you have compassion for all sentient beings or not? And, and if you don't, there are essentially some beings that are capable of suffering that you don't think count morally. So, that's the opposite. The opposite or the flip side is saying there are some classes of sentient beings that I do not think count morally. So that's the opposition. And then on the naturalism side, the simplest opposition is supernaturalism, which I guess means forming beliefs, you know, that, that aren't grounded in evidence or reasoning. So, you know, that, that might be an interesting way of putting the 
counterpoint, you know, there's almost those two major ways of disagreeing with sentientism. You either exclude some sentient beings from our compassion, or you ground your beliefs in something that isn't evidence and yeah. reasoning. Let's see, I, I mean, let's stick with the compassion for just another mm. couple of minutes. I don't know anybody who do, who wouldn't call themselves a sentientist on that basis. Yeah. But you know, it's like something happens on the on the way from the mouth to the stomach. Yeah. Yeah. Or it, like it, it feels it feels much more like like this incredible blind spot. Yeah. Around where people are simply it's it's not that they have a coherent worldview that says that eating factory farmed animals is okay. It's that. They have a coherent worldview and they are in such utter denial that if you touch them with sentientism, it's it's like, you know, the there's they have no skin and it's just, you know, it's just hitting raw nerves and there's yeah. no there's no conversation to be had. Yeah. And I th in a way, I think that's the central challenge because it's it's a frustrating message in a way because the social norms and the indoctrination are so powerful and so pervasive. It feels very difficult working against those. Um, but the positive side of it is that the raw materials are already there. As you say, you know, most people just intuitively and obviously feel a compassion that goes beyond the human species already. You know, the way most people will feel about their companion animals as a great example. So I'm never quite sure whether to take that, you know, good news, bad news. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I do agree because many people, you know, will hear about the basics of sentientism and they'll agree in concept. And then you say, well, this is what it means in practice. And then things fall apart because they've actually, um, while they might theoretically agree with having a compassion for all sentient beings in concept, they've had parts of that blocked by these social norms and by these habits and by these traditions that have led them very far astray. And there are some people who will say, you know, and you will hear the common sense version of this on as a as a vegan on Twitter every day, right? No, I do care about animals, but I still eat them. But when you play that through in simple terms, it's clear those things aren't consistent. You know, if you if I have compassion for you, but it, but it still enables me to, you know, have you harmed and killed for trivial pleasures, that's not a moral consideration or a compassion worth having, right? That That is in practical terms, zero moral consideration. I don't, you know, if you were to think that way about another human being, but to say, no, I care about them, but I, you know, I did, these things to them well we do that no as well logical sense. well there's a degree of that there's a degree, but but not quite in the same it, in a way it feels with non-human animals so much starker and more direct you know in, in the industrialization and the commission of the acts and the consumption of of the beings we're talking about but i agree you can apply it through to the human world too and say well you know it's nice that you say we should have universal human rights but what about x y and z and i think that's part of the you might say, well, what's the point of having a worldview if people have it in concept but don't apply it into practice? But I think we're, it helps us work on the practice if we can be really clear about this worldview because it is something we can hold up uh, and challenge people in their behaviours against and say, well, you say this, but here are the implications. And maybe the clarity of that stance you know, is a, a useful lever as we work to break down these social norms that get in the way of our compassion. I'm suddenly remembering um, a wonderful scene in uh, Douglas Adams' book, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe. If you're, yeah, yeah, you know, awesome. Yeah. I, fi I figured you were a fan of his. Yes, um, yes. Where, or there were the, the, and the scene is that they're sitting, I can't remember who's sitting at the table ready to order, and the waiter comes over, and the waiter is a cow, <laughs> a talking cow, who's describing the, the, the various cuts of meat that they can order off of this cow who's about to be killed for their food and they're horrified right? yeah. like because yeah. you know this is a sentient being in in uh, connection with them in this moment and he's like but but i want to die would you rather <laughs> yeah. would you rather kill some cow who doesn't yeah, 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 yeah. it kind of shook me a little bit i was i think it was well before i was a vegetarian or vegan I'm like there's something going on there and that's one of the weird things in, in that um it's so easy to tap into the, you know, the acrasia or the cognitive dissonance or just the denial. It's what was, what so, was that word? Um, so cognitive dissonance. Acrasia? Acrasia. Yeah. So acrasia, as I understand it, is like the next level beyond cognitive dissonance. So cognitive, cognitive dissonance is believing, you know, two incompatible things and the, you know, uh -huh. the psychological distress that might come from that. Acrasia, as I understand it, is 
the next step beyond where, for example, you might know that even in terms of your own morality, animal product consumption is wrong, but you just do it anyway. Uh -huh. So it's almost like another level of disconnection between your own uh -huh. moral, rational thinking and, and your behavior. Yeah. And I think like, many people like, are in that mode. And then like denial is obviously another level where you just, you know, like I did for many decades, just deliberately avoid thinking about the topic because you have this sense of where it will lead you and you don't want to go there. So what crazy is me still ordering from Amazon after, <laughs> complete, after completely disapproving of their label, labor practices. That could maybe that maybe that's another good example, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> slimy. Yeah. But, but we're you know, and, and again, a positive framing on this in a way is that it feels like when it comes to the, you know, the animal product world and animal ethics, in a way, it almost feels like technically and morally we've won the argument already. You know, there are no real pushbacks, and and just as time goes on, we have more and more arguments on our side about climate, environment, and zoonotic disease and antimicrobial mm -hmm. resistance and so on. It's almost as if the the technical argument has has been won, it's over, it's done. Now, all we have to do, and this is a silly thing to say because this is the big problem, it's about those social norms. Um, which and, is where, which is where I guess, you know, the, the, the fake meats and the cultured cells can come in. It's like, okay, well, if people can be just as happy doing the right thing, like if, you know, yeah. if, if uh, anti-amazon.com showed up and they were just as convenient and they treated their workers well. And I'd be like, yeah, cool. I can keep yeah. doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and I think that's it, right? And you, then you get into the very, very difficult space. And there's some brilliant academics doing work about how to, you know, which levers to pull and how. And, uh, you know, you and I have interviewed some of them. Um, because I think, you know, moral argument does work, but it doesn't work very fast. And it doesn't work with very many people. You know, your guests and my guests on our podcast are probably pretty weird outliers and that most of them have, mm. you know, listened to moral arguments, thought things through and been willing to make changes, even at risk of, you know, some, you know, social uh, challenges. Um, but we know it's, you know, slow and, and painful generally just to use moral argument, although that you can reach tipping points where things can change remarkably quickly. But yeah, it does then feed into this other way of thinking of, look, how can we make it fast, cheap, and easy for people to do the right thing. And then maybe when they're doing more of the right thing, that will free them because they will no longer be implicated. It will free them to actually bring their ethics to where they already were. Um, maybe there we can see some really rapid changes. Yeah. So one, one of the things I think about is like, what's the root of like the human dysfunction, the human ethical dysfunction? And, and, yeah. and depending on who I'm reading on a given day, it could be capitalism, it could be kind of the narcissism of Western civilization in general. It could be religion. Um, it, you know, it, it could be just, you know, we're doing fine. We're just going through this phase. You know, like I, I, I read a philosopher, um, eco philosopher named Bill Plotkin, who mm. has, has been talking about like the current crisis, like humans are basically the imaginal cells of the like we could be amazing or we could be a yeah. like like really interesting crapshoot like for nature to create humans yeah, like, yeah absolutely who knows where this will go yeah uh, <laughs> i'm not sure what my question is there but but like what you know what what's your thought about like well, I think you know that, where where do we go wrong well i think the we can we can in a way you can blame evolution for a lot of this stuff because um if you go back to you know where we began and uh, you can look back even to pre-human evolution. I think it's given us um, a lot of our problems. It's given us, um, you know, our tribalism. It's given us our, you know, maybe our defensiveness. It's given us some paranoia. It's given our, us uh, the motivation to detect agency where maybe there isn't any agency. Um, it's given us our aggression. It's given our, you know, competitive urges, which can have negative downsides as well. So you can see where... You know that came from because ultimately we are just another pretty weird type of uh you know mammalian ape so but but at the same time it's also given us and arguably many non-human animals the seeds of the good stuff as well right so um you know humans didn't invent compassion i think mothers have felt compassion for their children and family members have felt compassion for many many hundreds of millions of years before humans came on the scene and non-human animals feel those things too so i think in this sense of uh you know, an intuitive compassion that we've then maybe intellectualized, but also this pattern of behaviors that recognize the value of cooperation. Um, and that might be, you know, just in an adaptive sense, you know, termites building a mound together or 
ants leaving trails of pheromones to lead each other to food, you know, that can feel quite technical and practical, you know, just help them survive. But again, it's something that we've picked up as part of our evolutionary legacy. And, you know, we've built on it to an incredible extent. So I think we've got both the good and the bad, you know, built into us. And in a way, I guess the human condition is using these weird intellectual capabilities we've, you know, developed out of reasons that were really driven through our ability to, you know, survive roaming the savanna, <laughs> to then, you know, use that intellect to try and tip the tide in the battle between good and evil. And, and it, in a sense, we've got to the point now where we are still, just by definition, still part of biological evolution, right? There's no way of escaping that. You know, everything around us is an extended phenotype, if you like. You know, the laptop here, in, in a sense, is like like the termite mound. Um, so we're still part of that system. There's no way of escaping it. But at the same time, we've developed a capacity where we can just decide that gene propagation is not what we're going to focus on anymore. So we're almost betraying, you know, our genetic evolution and just deciding that other things matter. You know, my own experience, my own suffering, your suffering, the suffering of other sentient beings. So, yeah, that's. Um, I don't want to ramble on too long, but I think we've been given both the good and the bad, and we're now using our intellect and our rationality imperfectly to, you know, decide what we want to do next. And and as to the future, I mean, I, I do remain reasonably optimistic about where we'll get to long term, as long as we give ourselves the chance to get to the long term. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting to think, you know, the, the image is coming to me is sort of we're like, you know, teetering. We have we have both, yeah. you know, like angel and devil on the on the shoulders. Like we have both of these proclivities, the, the tribalism to kind of be suspicious and hate anyone who doesn't look like us, yeah. uh, which is wrapped up in our love of, of those in our tribe. Um, and it's, you know, from from my perspective, a lot of sort of, you know, global late stage capitalism is really pushing us in the, the, the awful directions in that, um, you know, like just in terms of like the, the, the neurophysiology of stress, yeah. when you feel, when you feel competitive, when you feel like there is a lack, you're going to be much more hyper-competitive, hyper-aggressive, tunnel focused on what you need. And we live in a society and we you know, from advertising to uh, social inequality to economic inequality, where many of us just feel that lack pressing down on us on a daily basis. I'm wondering if that's sort of, you know, skewing the odds of us being sentientists as opposed yeah. to just being, you know, gre greedy, stressed out apes. Yeah, egoistic and self-centered. And, and it may do. There's certainly a risk there. And, and one of the interesting things about this sort of sentientist way of thinking is that people who ascribe to it seem to cover the entire uh, socio-political and economic map as well. So I think all of them are socially liberal because by definition, if you have compassion for all sentient beings, there's no space for you know, negative discriminations in there. But when it comes to economic models or political models, it's been really interesting to find there are people who are you know, fairly ne neoliberal on capitalism and think that we might be able to shift it to embed more compassionate values because you know, humans have compassion so why not express that through capitalism others think we need some radically different system others take a more communal you know socialistic or communistic approach others are anarchist so you know that's an aside really but there's a people differ radically in their views about what's the best economic and political system to try and make the world better for all sentient beings but put that to one side i think capitalism is a fascinating example because on the one hand it's almost the most extreme version of cooperation you can imagine because you know, the, 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 the number of people that needed to work together to get me this laptop or to get us the Zoom technology we, we're using to talk on is an incredible um, uh, form of cooperation of various different supposedly self-interested humans to, you know, deliver something that you and I value. So there's, a, you know, there's something positive about that. There's also something positive in a, the capitalist ideal about, you know, freedom. You know, I can choose what I want and I can produce what I want and things will play out and I'll be rewarded in terms of the value I deliver to others, which might sound like it has the element of compassion in, you know, I, I get rewarded if I'm helping others. Mm. But of course, that's not what much of late stage capitalism feels like. It feels like a, you know, a status game. It feels like there are concentrations of power in unhealthy ways. It feels like there are uh, corporations that are motivated not to, uh, you know, make us happy and comfortable, but if we get too comfortable to give us new latent needs that we didn't even know we had that make us feel unsatisfied so we'll buy more so 
yeah, again, it's this really weird situation where you can see some sort of positive elements about cooperation and sharing and freedom and helping and doing things together. And then some, you know, warping that takes us off track and leads us to egoism and status anxiety and consumerism and extractive industries and destruction of the environment. And yeah, so I don't, you know, yeah. it's hard. It's hard. I don't have yeah. an easy well, I mean, it seems like one, one of the countervailing forces against this extreme, the destructive ego, egoism is the sentientist idea of compassion for all beings who can feel and sense that it's, you know, that in, in a sense, when, when, I'm, when I'm really wrapped up in my egoism and it's just like me for myself, yeah. not only am I not a sentientist, I don't even, I don't even care about you. Yeah. I don't even care about my neighbor. All, you know, yeah. the worse it gets, like I, I'd sacrifice anybody to get, yeah. to get, to get mine. Yeah, I agree. And it's, um, there are different ways of talking about this, you know, universal compassion for all sentient beings. You can take a sort of rational approach and say, well, um, uh, you know, you already have compassion for X, Y, and Z sentient beings. What's your logical reason for constraining your compassion for all the others? And if there isn't one, then you should care about them all. Um, you can say, um, you know, it will feel better to have this type of ethic because it's generous and rich and you know, has a logical basis. Um, you can say it will be better for you, you know, even selfishly, it will be better for you to have this ethic because cooperation is good for you. And even though you might not see how, you know, you can cooperate with all those other sentient beings, ultimately in long causal chains, it will be better for you and the people around you if we take this compassionate approach, partly because, you know, we enjoy living in a world where the others around us are more compassionate. So there's a bunch of ways you can, you know, sort of argue people towards it but in a sense it you know morality might just be a choice right if, if if you decide to only care about howard uh you know there will be consequences of that hopefully in the wider society but you know there's there's no objective external authority i can appeal to to tell you you're wrong <laughs> so um but i agree i think I, that's one thing i do say to you know I, I talk to people who you know either think we can make it more compassionate capitalism or we need a socialistic or even a communistic approach or an anarchist approach which ultimately is where marxism is supposed to end up once you've gone through the, the revolutionary <laughs> stages of course um but but i guess my message to them is whatever political or economic system you favor it's more likely to work better for the world if people believe things that are well tuned to reality through evidence and reason and if people have a more compassionate way of thinking because um you know, if, if, if all of the people participating in capitalism had a sentientist ethic, there would be no animal farming, for example. Um, and if everybody in a communist mode had a sentientist ethic, you wouldn't have the oppression that often comes out of, you know, the attempt to enforce communism because the compassion there is a safety mechanism. So again, my argument to, you know, whatever people's political and economic philosophy is, um, it will work better if we have a sentientist ethic and a worldview sitting behind it. Yeah. yeah. So we're almost we're almost at an hour, and I haven't even begun to the the, the first half, which is about evidence <laughs> yeah. and reason. So I'm a little reluctant to kind of just dip my toe in the water there. Maybe we'll save that for when I'm on on your podcast. And uh, yeah, can, happy we can, to. We can hash that out. But uh, you know, I'm just sort of curious about you know if the world is in such in many ways dire straits. And, and, and sentientism could help. Do you feel like the, the big problem is a, a deficit of, of extended compassion or a deficit of regard for evidence and reason? Yeah, well, I do think it's both. Um, I think if, if you force me to pick, I would go for the sentiocentrism, I would go for the compassion, but I do think it's both. And that's why I've bundled the two together into this idea in the same way as humanism has done the same thing. Um, and yeah, we, we can delve into it a bit more when you come on my podcast. That'd be great if your, your uh, audience can come and join us there. But in simple terms, the, there's a few reasons why I think this naturalism thing, this evidence and reason commitment is also important. Um, one is that I just think we're more likely to be right in our understanding of the world or more accurate if we use evidence from reality to understand reality. So whatever we want to do, whatever our value systems, I think the more accurate our understanding and our beliefs are, the more effective we'll be in the world in trying to make it better. Um, and I think anything that um, isn't grounded in evidence is just more likely to be wrong. 
so so that's i guess one reason that's like a practical reason why i think naturalism is a good way about doing things i think the other thing is that even for people who are richly and deeply and generously compassionate there can be risks of those generous ethics being warped under some types of supernatural thinking um, certainly not always the case you know some supernatural beliefs can be beneficial some are just irrelevant or, and interesting some are fun some are curious but don't have an impact on our ethics but all too often supernatural worldviews seem to warp otherwise compassionate ethics and that can either be because the universal compassion is then made um, conditional or um, constrained so you might find that for example in some religious worldviews where they will say you know if you're in the tent and you've been saved by Jesus you will go to heaven anyone outside of that even people who've never had the chance to hear the word of the Lord will go and burn for a hell in eternity and I think that's a warping of a compassionate ethics in a pretty radical way so there's an in-group out-group thing that can sometimes warp the uh, this universal compassion but there's often a conditional compassion as well so instead of it being universal it's well you'll get to keep my compassion but only if you follow these rules mm. and you follow them in the way that i've laid out and those rules were probably written down a couple of thousand years ago by you know by a, by a man in a very different time so so th there's that conditionality and constraint on universal compassion that i think can sometimes flow from the supernatural worldview um, there can sometimes be arbitrary rules which were set in a different time uh, that I don't think fit today. You know, I don't think following the words of Leviticus or uh, some of the sections of the Quran are great ways of guiding our sex lives or what we wear or what we eat today um, and cause many harm to people outside of those communities and within them. Um, and I think the final thing I'd say, which is a risk, is that when we move away from a naturalistic worldview that says, you know, we should just care about sentient beings, quite often in a supernatural worldview, something else is put as more important than the sentient beings. Uh, that doesn't have to be religious, you know, that could be a national leader, or it could be blood and soil, it could be a nation state, or it could be a cult leader, or it could be a god, or it could be the church or the church institution. And as soon as those things become to be seen as more important than the suffering and death of sentient beings, you tend to get suffering and death of sentient beings. Um, and the classic example that I've used a couple of times before is, you know, that one of Abraham and Isaac, where God s says to Abraham, as a test of his faith, I want you to kill your own son. And Abraham felt compassion for Isaac. I'm sure he loved him. Right. So the compassion was absolutely there. But the supernatural ethic was one thing is more important than your compassion. And that is your obedience to me, even if I tell you to do something that has no compassion in it. So that's a lot. That's a sort of hopefully an intro to why I think. I don't think all supernatural beliefs systems are harmful by any means. Many of them have rich veins of compassion within them, but I'm just nervous of some of those dangers. Whereas if we stick to a naturalistic approach, I think um, we're less likely to bump into them. Gotcha. I just, I just want to say that, um, you know, grow, growing up Jewish and studying the, um, not just the, 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 the text of the Bible, but also the, you know, the rabbinic, arguments over it over hundreds yeah. of years there's a strong vein that's, that's, that is that abraham failed that test oh really the, te the yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Well, yeah so that? the real so the real test was one of compassion yes yeah that's fascinating yeah i wasn't aware of yeah. that actually yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well i like that interpretation i'm going to go with that one yeah <laughs> So, so one, of, oh, let's end, I want to end, end with getting your thoughts on this, which is something that's shocked me over the last few years in the plant-based, vegan, natural health movement. Yeah, is that people have gone crazy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. And 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 at first it just seemed like, what the hell is going on? This is an anomaly. And then later it started to seem like some of my beliefs or or the the community that i live in is part of a slippery slope so if i'm plant-based and i've been plant-based for 30 years and the world is never caught up yeah and there's so much evidence for the benefits the health benefits the environmental benefits the ecological everything and yet all the doctors around me are saying you should eat meat and a, then i start to think well, there's some conspiracy out there, or, or I know more than other people. Yeah. 
And then if I'm doing yoga and everyone else around me is is walking around with with bad backs and I've got this, you know, and I'm doing Ayurveda and I'm getting massages and and then all of a sudden I'm supporting QAnon and (laughs) and and Trumpist neo-fascism. And I'm part of this community that's been saying, see, we've you can't trust the mainstream media. Yeah. And I know this gets this is going to get into kind of that whole idea of evidence and reason. And I just will say, like, there have been a few times in my life where I have been involved in stories that were reported in the news and the news every single time got it completely wrong. Yeah. Which leads me to, to sort of question, like, where do I get my evidence? But like, what, what's what's your sense? I mean, you're sort of, you know, I don't know how deeply connected you are to sort of the vegan community or plant based or alternative health. But what's your sense of like, how we've shit the bed on this <laughs> beautifully but i think this is another point this is another reason why i'm so committed to this naturalism side because when we come back to the, the veganism world and the animal advocacy world it's an important part of maintaining our credibility as, as a movement because we're already targets for you know thinking in this sort of woo way thinking that veganism cures cancer thinking that you know there's there's um that sort of sense around parts of the community. That's one of the reasons um, we're challenged. So I think it's important for us to almost double down on a naturalistic approach to make sure that when we are making claims about environmental impact of plant-based or the health claims of plant-based or whatever it is, that we are are grounding those with humility in actual evidence. Um, And I think you're right, it's it's also difficult because as part of a minority group that is absolutely convinced we're right about the ethics of animal farming and fishing for example but we, and we it seems so obvious to us but we're in a tiny minority it leads you into thinking there must be some conspiracy going on you know how can everybody else disagree with me so i can see the temptation of people moving into some of those modes of thinking where you just say well i don't trust institutions or the press or journalism or industry or government on this topic which is very important to me so i'm going to throw the whole lot out and start turning to sources that frankly don't even pretend to have any evidence at all. Um, Now, I don't think there is a perfect answer to this because there's no perfection in naturalism at all. It's just setting credences based on evidence that is always imperfect and always changing. But I think um, it is about having the appropriate level of skepticism. Uh, And that means we can be skeptical of scientific thinking and the press and journalism and mainstream institutions, but it also means we just don't burn them to the ground and start making stuff up either. Um, And I think quite often when we do think through in a reasonably balanced way, we can find our way to, um, you know, making robust, clear, positive claims that are well supported by scientific evidence about the health impact of plant-based, which I think is strengthening by the month. I think uh, the evidence base about you know, the climate and environmental impacts of a plant-based lifestyle and a just transition away from animal agriculture. Again, the evidence is strong and powerful and growing by the month. We don't need to overplay our hand. Mm. And when you go into um, some of the more outlandish things you talked about, whether it's QAnon or anti-vax or various conspiracy theories or flat earthers, um, when you see a story that feels, going back to your Yuval Noah Harari thing, right? Where you where you come across a narrative that just feels too convincing because it has all the answers, hmm. but when you dig under the surface, there's actually no evidence there at all. We've just got to be ready to watch out for those things uh, because this pattern of a, an understandable distrust of institutions and sort of mainstream stuff, and therefore I'm going to completely jump the shark and start believing reassuring stories that have no foundation whatsoever in reality, is you know, to go from one awful extreme to the other. And there, I think there is a middle road where we can improve and shape and change institutions by pulling them back to an evidence base. Yeah, what, one of the things that's, uh, that's not endeared me when I've been on other people's podcasts or they've been on mine and they're, and they're sort of, you know, the ethical vegans is that I will say that I am not sure that veganism is the best ethical path there is. Mm-hmm. Like I follow it. And I'm kind of, I'm pretty sure, but I can't, I can't defend it in, you know, to the death, like, and, and it seems like, like um, this sort of form of like Socratic humility is very important to this, uh, to, to the practice of sentientism. Does that sound right? Yeah, it does. And I think we, I think, you know, 
sometimes the sort of scientific community and particularly non-religious people, you know, atheists can sometimes come across as really, being really sharp edged and harsh and overconfident. They're almost dogmatic in the same way as they might criticize the religious, right? But the real heart of naturalism is humility and open-mindedness and always looking at different hypotheses and different sets of evidence, being skeptical of all of them and balancing all of them. It's not about saying, I've done the spreadsheet, here is the answer, now I'm stopping listening. Right? That's not what naturalism is. We need to have this sort of um, epistemological humility and openness and, and recognize that we are, you know, apes wandering the savannah, right? What gives us the right to have perfect knowledge? We're outside of maths or formal systems. We're just not going to have it, right? We're just going to have different degrees of confidence. So our beliefs should be provisional, probabilistic, and where they have an ethical impact, prudent. So I think that humility is important there. But I think you're right. We should have that humility and pluralism on the ethical side as well, right? What, what gives us the confidence that a list of dare ontological rules or a virtue ethic or a care ethic is exactly the right thing in all circumstances? Shouldn't we be open-minded about our morals as well so yeah I'd, I'd agree that sort of humility on both the ethical side and the facts and reason side are deeply important All right and one of the things i really appreciate from listening to you is your unwillingness to call other people names <laughs> and not yet <laughs> i might get snarky on twitter occasionally when i lose control but <laughs> yeah <laughs> right but that's uh was it uh a crazier or a... <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I just can't help myself. Yeah. yeah, but but I think that's that's an important part of this universal, universally compassionate idea uh, that I think you're right. M you know, many vegans forget too, understandably, um, because it, universal compassion means universal compassion, right? And that's not just for farmed animals. That means for wild and liminal sentient animals as well, which can be a tricky topic for many animal advocates and vegans. But it also means- What do you mean by, what do you mean by that, wild and liminal? So, so wild animals just living in the wild in you know, nature, you know, uh, uh, outside of human spaces largely, and liminal uh, animals are uh, the ones that are sort of in between that might, they're, they're wild, but live in and around human spaces. So, you know, you might think of rats in a city or pigeons uh -huh. things. So, so, so in a sense, sentientism is saying, um, you know, this isn't just about animal farming. This is about having moral consideration for all of those other sentient mm. non-human animals as well. And if you want to get sci-fi, at least be, maybe be open-minded about artificial intelligence and, as well. But, you know, that's a, that's a topic <laughs> for a different day. Um, but it's also about universal compassion for all human beings. And that, that isn't just universal compassion for human beings that we agree with that is compassion for people we disagree with, you know, that we have fundamental differences of opinion about, even for other humans that cause harm. Uh, and compassion doesn't mean appeasement or weakness. It doesn't mean we don't intervene, we don't constrain, we don't punish, but it does mean that you should have uh, compassion even for humans we disagree with. And maybe that's the toughest thing. And for ourselves too, which we too yeah. often forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and especially, especially if you want to, you know, be a contextualist like me and say, like, what we want is things that work. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, we, we it's, you know, we don't shame people. Like, I don't think PETA shames uh, fur wearers into not wearing furs. Yeah. Into becoming animal advocates. It can, it can drive it underground, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But and, it's, we're not and, it, and it's difficult because I do have sympathy for it because I think once, you know, once, if you like, the blinkers have been taken off around something like, fur farming or animal farming generally the horror is so egregious and so direct and so visceral and obvious that you of course it's natural to be outraged and to and to preach and to challenge even attack i mean it's it's understandable and, and that's sort of what you do if it was a topic in human ethics if you woke up one morning and uh you know in in the time of slavery and you you suddenly realized what people were doing around you and were treating it as normal you'd be outraged yeah. But in a way, we have this we, we, we have this challenge because at the same time, that can undermine our compassion to the very people we used to be before we saw these things. And, right. and certainly undermines our compassion for the people we're trying to persuade. Um, and that's a difficult balance in a way. You know, when I think when you go vegan or you get serious about these issues, you give up one form of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> it's very freeing, right, because you see things as they are and you've withdrawn your participation from some of this harm, at least. But in a way, you, you then almost have to take on another form of cognitive dissonance deliberately because you have to keep that moral opprobrium sort of trapped away a little bit some, somewhere to, so that you can engage with compassion and, and help people see what, you could, what you've seen. So it's yeah, tricky. it's funny because I just, 
<laughs> I've just um, you know co-written a book on sort of how to help people change. Um, and the first the first step, if you know, if, is to go from critic to ally. Yeah. And the first step of the first step is to examine your own negative emotions, your anger, your outrage, your frustration, and find your own positive intent. Yeah. So I think you know if, I love if, it. if someone were to tell me, okay, you've just got to like stop being outraged. I could maybe swallow it, you know, in the interests of politics, but it would yeah. still be driving me. But if I can say, boy, I'm outraged and I'm outraged because I care and I'm deeply compassionate, then all of a sudden I feel better about it and I don't yeah. have to act from that place in a way that's going to get me the opposite of what I want. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. So. Cool. I didn't. I didn't know my work was going to be useful here, but I'm feeling pretty good about well, it. Well, I look forward to reading it. Yeah, no, it fits in. Yeah. Fits in beautifully. Yeah. Anything? Um, you know, we have many, many more things to talk about. But uh, in terms of today's conversation, anything you want to add or sort of put a bow on or wrap up with that that you think would be important? So, the, so, so, one thing I would say is that although sentientism is you know explicitly naturalistic, and I know that can sometimes you know, be difficult for people who are very committed to a religious or a supernatural worldview. The important point is that it's just a way of describing this way of thinking. Um, it doesn't mean we don't still have universal compassion for each other. It doesn't mean we don't share this sentiocentric compassion that we should work together on campaigns together and drive for the same ends. Um, this doesn't have to, it's not intended to be an exclusionary thing. You know, I have enormous respect for, you know, the rich veins of compassion that flow through supernatural and religious worldviews um, and all of the online forums and groups that we've set up around the sentientism idea are open to everybody. So we have people from the Animal Interfaith Alliance and Catholics for Animals and, um, you know, spiritual but not religious people, you know, who all share, are interested in these ways of thinking, but don't necessarily think of themselves as naturalistic or sentientist in the group so they're all completely open the idea is universal compassion and we can work together together on that end regardless of you know the basis of what we think is real and what isn't great so where where can where can be people who are drawn to this or drawn to to argue it in a good yeah in a good and, and, I, and i and i'd love to continue the conversation so if people want to challenge it ask questions about it tell me i'm crazy you know i, I, I love all of that um and in if you basically search for the word sentientism anywhere you'll find us. And sentientism, you got the pronunciation perfectly. It is just the word sentient with ism on the end. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we have a website, sentientism.info, which has links to all of our different forums and groups and writing and communities. I run a sentientism YouTube and podcast with 83 episodes so far with fascinating range of interviews with not just philosophers, but also activists and CEOs and, act and um, actors and world from uh screen and stage as well which is fascinating because again i don't want this to seem like a super deep academic philosophy it's supposed to be you know an everyday commitment to evidence reason and compassion for all sentient beings that anyone can understand in a sentence as well mm. um and then we have a bunch of different online forums and groups so our biggest is a, a group on face facebook but we have telegram reddit um Discord, you know, all of the other places people might expect to find us. And I'm on Twitter as well, at Jamie Woodhouse and at Sentientism. Gotcha. So if, if, uh, if people wanted to go to one place to sort of the, the uh, clearinghouse, they'd go to sentientism.info? That has all of the links. Great. All right. So I'll, I'll include that and I'll get a bunch of other links from you and throw them into the show notes. And uh, this has been, yeah, this has been beautiful and I'm, uh, I have a bigger smile on my face when we're finished than when I started. So, uh, likewise, thank you. Yeah. It's been, been a pleasure wonderful. to talk to you and a, a privilege to, to reach out to your audience as well. I hope they find the idea interesting. Awesome. Well, thank you for all the work you do and for taking the time today, Jamie. Thanks. Alan. Take care. Bye-bye.